The date was September 22, 1865. A newborn baby lies in its cradle. Smaller than most infants, its tiny head could be placed in a teacup. This child and a family of several children would be sickly and frail. In a difficult and trying age, where every member contributed to the survival of the family, a constantly sick and frail child was often too much of an added load for a struggling family. A loving and concerned mother, bearing the tremendous weight that rested upon her shoulders, fell before an all-knowing God and cried out to Him in a deeply agonizing prayer for help. If this child is never going to amount to anything, let him die. He is such a care. If thou hast something special for him to do, heal him up and let him live. Little was the realization in that moment of prayer that God indeed had something special for him to do. Little in that moment of time that the mother realized that God would so profoundly heal him and use him. Little was the understanding in that moment of concern that such a dynamic, phenomenal, marvelous life lay before this child. But that child would eventually become God's chosen vessel to lead the divine institution of the Church of God. That child would become that man, A.J. Tomlinson. The time was 1877. A father and his 12-year-old son were working their farm near Westfield, Indiana. Their backs were bent, swaying to and fro, and they worked together swaying the large log with their hooser cross-cut saw. Back and forth push, pull, as the teeth of the saw bit into the log. Suddenly, as someone had called, the boy raised up. Father, did you call? Puzzled, the father replied, no. With great wonder, the boy reassumed his work, questioning why he had heard his family pet name way out here in the midst of nowhere. But he was to be even more mystified, for the call of his name would be heard not once, nor twice, but three distinct times. Who was it? Where did it come from? What did it mean to the 12-year-old boy? The total significance of that call could not and would not be understandable for the next several years. It was not until 12 years later that he would begin to understand and answer that call. But when he ultimately did answer, he answered with 56 years of one of the most dynamic, far-reaching, influential Christian lives this world has ever known. Answering the call of God was to guide the uncovering of the great church of God. The boy was to become that man, A.J. Tomlinson. The time was the 1880s. Political fever was running high. A young man, even though under the voting age, was very enthusiastic, promoting the choice of his party. The political issues were hot and heavy, but capably mastered by the young mind. Every effort was put forth to produce a winner, and everywhere he went, it was hooray for his candidate. He became so involved that he boldly stated that if his party was defeated, he would quit the United States and go to Australia. But if his party should win, he would get married and settle down. The day was finally approaching. His zeal and enthusiasm mounted higher and higher, the election would finally come and his party would finally be victorious. Consequently, the man was to marry and settle down. But in that first year of marriage, life was to have a profound experience that would forever change his political support for any candidate. The zeal once spent upon political issues, the enthusiasm once given to a political candidate, and the eagerness to win once applied to the political battles would now be channeled towards the promotion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. His cry, everywhere and every place, would now become an enthusiastic hooray for Jesus. That man was A.J. Tomlinson. The time was 1889. A farmer was working in the hayfield near his home in Indiana. When the angry clouds of a storm appeared on the horizon, and the sky darkened, the pace quickened. The effort increased as he hurried to finish before the rains came. Suddenly, however, as if someone had opened up the sky, the rains came gushing down as he dashed for cover from the downpour. There was nothing to do but wait out the storm in the protection of his home. But on this day, for this man, there would be little protection. All of a sudden, with an excessively loud clap of thunder, a striking of lightning shot through the house, down through the chimney, out through the cook stove, and back through the ceiling. 
This charge of electricity was to miss him by only a few short feet. Later that evening, no doubt thinking of that bolt of lightning, he turned saying to his wife, it's time for us to pray. Taking her Bible, he read a few verses of scripture and for the first time they knelt together in prayer. That man who had prayed little, if at all, was now on his knees crying out to God, as it had been with other great men, Saul in the brightness of light, Luther with his bolt of lightning, this man too was made aware of his great need for conversion by this phenomenal summons from God. That man was A.J. Tomlinson. The time was the early 1890s. A young man rose to his feet, nervous and perhaps a little shy. He faced the congregation for one of his first sermons. A revival had broken out in a prayer meeting in the little church near his home. With the ministry and older saints failing to accept the responsibility, the young convert rose to meet the challenge. He had amply prepared for his sermon, but panic began to rise in his throat. His pulse began to throb faster, his mouth went dry, and a knot developed in his stomach as he completely lost his text. Panicked, he frantically searched unsuccessfully to find it. In desperation, he read whatever his eyes caught as he hurried and scanned over the pages of the Bible. Then he spoke a little on it, a few stampering broken utterances. Yet, God blessed the willingness and effort as people literally fell into the altar to be converted. Thus, in that little church near his home, one of the most dynamic preachers of the church, which had ever produced, began his ministry. From this humble beginning, of a few stampering broken utterances, would develop a ministry with the ability to hold huge congregations in captive awe, hour after hour, sermon after sermon. That man was A.J. Tomlinson. The time was probably 1893. At 12 noon, the struggle was now in the heat of battle for days and nights of continuous fighting and wrestling. The violent contest had continued. No help could be offered. No help was given. It was to be an individual hand-to-hand -hand fight. But one contestant, often missing meals and slept to prepare, was ready for this last great conflict. Faced with the ghostly forms and furious yells of the misutterings of forces of the demons of hell, the battle will soon have been lost, except for the host of angels sent to assist in this terrible hour of fight. The enemy was shown no quarter. The sharp two-edged sword was doing its deadly work. But the cry of the victor out of the bitterness of his soul began, Now! Now! You've got to give it up now! The victory was finally coming. With the sword pushed to the hilt into the flesh of the enemy, suddenly, as the enemy began to quiver and weaken, a sensational power like a thunderbolt from the sky ended the conflict. The struggle was finally over. The old man lay dead at his feet. The sanctifying victory was won. The man, by God's power, was victorious. That man was A.J. Tomlinson. The time was the late 1890s. The place was the crossing of a mountainous road and a stream close by. Perched upon the foot log were two boys, perhaps resting from a hike in the woods, a swim in the creek, or fishing in one of the stream's fishing holes. First, they saw the stranger as he sat in his covered hack. Then they could hear the horse and the squeaking of the wagon as it slowly came closer to them. The wagon stopped at the creek. The horse bowed his head to sip the cool, refreshing water. The friendly stranger spoke his greetings. A conversation was started and he informed the boys that he sold Bibles, testaments, and other religious materials. One of the young lads suggested that he should meet his father who was also very religious. So the Bible-carrying stranger was led down the path to the boy's home. Little was the realization as the men introduced themselves of the significance of this meeting for it was to be to this home the stranger would come again and again. It would be to this home that the stranger, in just a few short years, would come when he came back down the mountain at the back of the house from a mighty prayer with God. It would be to this home that the stranger would bring the revelation of the Church of God of the Bible, for that home was the home of W.F. Bryant, and the stranger 
was that man, A.J. Tomlinson. The date was Saturday, June 13th, approximately around 8 a.m. in 1903. Several people had gathered together in a small frame house nestled among the trees at the foot of a mountain. They had come with an ear of excitement, a feeling of anticipation as they were to search for the truth of God's word. There was one, moreover, who had felt a special sensation all through the night, and he waited for the dawning of that eventful day. Rising early, he made his way out of the house and up the steep incline, as if an unseen hand were leading him to the top of the mountain. There he found the spot. He knelt to pray, and all of heaven opened to him, rising, shining with the radiance of God's revealed truth. He made his way back down to the mountain. Questions were being asked and Bible answers as he entered the meeting in progress. The Bible was presented to him as he stood before the warmth of the fireplace, but the warmth of that fireplace was no match for the fire of God that was burning within his heart as he heard these words, Will you take this Bible as the Word of God, believe it, and practice it, obey His precepts, and walk in the light as God is in the light? Profoundly, as he thought of his prayer on the mountain, the decision was made and prophecy fulfilled. Darkness could no longer hide the glorious light of the Church of God. That man was A.J. Tomlinson. The date was Sunday morning, January 12, 1908. The service was in progress. The Sunday morning message was going forth. Suddenly, a peculiar sensation took hold of the man. Almost without thinking, he slipped off his chair and fell to his knees at the feet of the preacher. The man was mystified. He didn't know what such an experience meant. His mind was clear, but such a peculiar power engulfed and thrilled his whole being that he decided to yield completely to God. This was it. Neither food, friendship, nor anything else would stand in the way of this prayer. He wanted one thing, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Soon he was lost in his surroundings, lying on the floor, occupied only with the thought of God. His body began to shake under the awesome power of the Holy Ghost, first his feet, then his arms, and next his head, until it seemed that his entire body was rolled and tossed in a minute of examination. Mysteriously, miraculously, marvelously, his entire body was lifted and floated several feet to rest again on the floor as indescribable billows of joy flooded his soul. Deeper and deeper and richer and richer, such floods of glory ran through his whole being for several minutes. It was almost beyond human experience, but the end of the experience was not in sight. As it were, there in person he stood in Central America, in Brazil, in Chile in South America, in Africa, Jerusalem, Russia, France, Japan, and the Northern United States were envisioned by his entire being, not only seeing, hearing, feeling, but speaking as well. He was made aware of the great needs of the people. Ten different locations he saw in a vision, ten different languages he experienced and spoke. That man was being blessed by God. If not enough, the dream, the vision, the miraculous experience carried him into direct contact with the devil. And the struggle was on. The spirit moved, involving him, speaking through him, instructing him. The man was taught the ways of deliverance from the diabolic powers of Satan. Indeed, a peculiar power had engulfed him. A supernatural sensation had led him. A miraculous strength had moved him. This peculiar power, the supernatural sensation, the miraculous strength, was baptizing the man with the Holy Ghost and fire. The man had prayed for the experience and God had answered. That man was A.J. Tomlinson. The date was September 10th, approximately around 7.30 p.m., 1908. Hundreds, thousands were flocking into the huge tent that had been erected from what many have since called the greatest revival Cleveland, Tennessee has ever experienced. History would record 225 conversions, 163 baptized with the Holy Ghost, and 106 united with the church. For 10 weeks, people came from miles around to see and experience this monumental, marvelous move of God. The service began, songs were sung as the people worshiped their God. Suddenly, as if someone had directed them, people all over the congregation began to be seized with a spirit of great weeping compassion drove them to one great united prayer. After the prayer had subsided somewhat, the preacher stepped forward, 
mounting the altar, he briefly preached the truth of God's word. But this was to be no ordinary message. For as he dynamically expounded the word, a visible blue vapor or mist was seen settling down over the congregation, and people literally turned pale over the mysteriousness of God. From all over the congregation, people came running, falling into the altar. 10, 20, 40, 60, 80. Faster and faster they came. The move of God was on. The man had preached. The Spirit was moving within that glorious church of God. That man was A.J. Tomlinson. The time was probably 1908. A glorious revival was in progress. People were healed by the power. People were slain under the power. People danced in the power. People shouted in the power. And people worshipped God in the power of the Holy Ghost and fire. There were services in the morning, services in the afternoon, and services in the night. Services saturated by the move of God. There were meetings in the tent, meetings in the homes, and meetings in the open. Meetings of God's power with man's need. Strikes of fire were seen over the tent and balls of fire inside the tent, and a blue mist of God filling the tent supernatural evidence of the presence of God's power. Strange manifestations, things were taking place. It was probably during this revival that a particularly strange phenomenon occurred. A group gathered in the home of the preacher. A glorious time was in store as God's power literally filled the room. People worshipped God. Suddenly music could be heard. Where was it coming from? Eyes turned towards the bed. There lying on the covers of the bed was the preacher's violin. Was the music coming from it? No one was near. No one was touching it. No one was playing it. Yet, music was pouring out of the instrument. Not touched, not played by human hands, yet glorious music sounded from its strings. For an unseen hand was making a beautiful melody. Just another demonstration of God's mighty presence surrounding the life of that man. A.J. Tomlinson. The date was May 27, 1909. The service was already in progress. God was using the preacher in a phenomenal way. Messages were given in tongues by the Holy Ghost, and he would then interpret those messages as the Holy Ghost so inspired. Suddenly, he was seized by tremendous weeping until he was so overwhelmed by the power of God that he fell over backward onto the floor. His heart was breaking. His cries of agony became louder until finally, as the strain of the experience was lessening. A message in tongues boldly went forth, and the man, lost in his surroundings and carried away into the presence of the Lord, boldly uttered the interpretation, Get quiet and hear me speak. Immediately a sister began to speak in tongues, only a few words and then interpretation. And for the next thirty minutes the tongues and interpretation alternatively went forth between the sister and the man until each sentence was completed. When she ceased, someone else spoke a few minutes, and the interpretation followed. Then another spoke, and another, and another. For two solid hours, the man, flat on his back, was used mightily to give the interpretation of each message given by different individuals. For two solid hours, the man, flat on his back, was lost to the present world, but was keenly aware of the spiritual world. For two solid hours, the Holy Ghost spoke through the man, flat on his back, a message straight from God. The spirit had moved, the man had obeyed, and without any other preaching, the altar filled with people crying out to their God. Men, women, and children were screaming, shouting, and praying, leaping, and dancing, falling under God's overwhelming power because the Holy Ghost had mightily used that man. That man was A.J. Tomlinson. The date was November the 23rd, 1909. The place was Cleveland, Tennessee, in the neighborhood of 25 and 25 Gott Street. Two people stood staring, mystified, looking into the sky. What is it? Was their astonished cry? Look! Look at the bright light! A peculiar phenomenon was taking place. They could not understand it. They could not explain it. They could only stand in awe as a light similar in appearance to the headlight of a locomotive danced in the sky several hundred feet above the ground. Look! There it is again! It is moving up and down above that house. I've never seen anything like this before in my life. Seconds go by, then minutes, as the light is hidden from their view for a few minutes, only to reappear. It was beyond their explanation. It was beyond their comprehension. They could only gaze in amazement. 
because they did not know what the man was doing in the house under the mysterious hoovering light. They could not understand this light, yet the light was playing in the sky over the house. The man was praying in the prayer room of the house. The mystifying light was appearing and reappearing above the house. The man was weeping and crying in the house. The phenomenal light was moving up and down in the sky. The man was moved with deep weeping, agonizing prayer in his bedroom. This light was giving witness to the man praying. That man was A.J. Tomlinson. The date was November the 3rd, 1922. The winds of disruption had become a hurricane of proportions. Weaker vessels gave way to the destructive forces of the winds that had blown out such gentle breezes. Gentle breezes taken so lightly. Gentle breezes that breed on a man's disobedience. Gentle breezes destined to destroy because man's greed for power made those gentle breezes become unstoppable winds of destruction. On and on and on they blew, every destroying through elders and declaration and finally to the very constitution. Was there no one to stand? Was there no one willing? Was there no one grieving? While others were being blown away, not aware of the winds that were taking them, there was one whose feet were planted. There was one who was crying out, I must be free. I must pray over it for nine months. I can't get away from it. I must be free to hold up the blessed old book and declare as of old, this is our only rule of faith and practice. The tide was turned and the truth prevailed and the convictions of the man were anchored to the rock of the church. That man was A.J. Tomlinson. The date was November the 21st, 1923 and delegates from across the nation and around the world had arrived for the 18th annual assembly. This was to be no ordinary gathering. This was to be no ordinary meeting. This was to be no ordinary assembly. For this gathering of the people, meeting in perfect unity and love, and destined to make this one of the greatest assemblies of the church had ever witnessed. There were signs and wonders, fire was handled, visions were seen, messages and interpretations were given. It was as if all the glory of the heavens bent low and kissed the earth as the people were favored with one of the most phenomenal moves of God ever recorded at a general assembly. Message after message, session after session, on and on. Higher and higher the people raised by one wave after another of the spiritual sound of a rushing mighty wind. Finally, after the report of the Committee on Bible Government was read and accepted by all, the man arose, speaking in very solemn tones, he boldly stated, Let the Secretary take note, at 4.30 p.m. November the 23rd, 1923, this assembly shook off the galing yoke of the Constitution and went free, and by the help of the Lord, this shall be forever. With a mighty shout of joy, the church was free, and for a solid 30 minutes the people rejoiced in the demonstration of the power, and with the help of the Lord, the cry of the man still remains true. Free, they shall be free forever. This man was that man, A.J. Tomlinson. The date was February the 4th through the 6th, 1924. The place was Harriman, Tennessee. The meeting was in progress in a private home and people were literally packed in in every available space. People were dancing, shouting, and rejoicing in the spirit. Suddenly, two sisters began to dance in the spirit, dancing over to the piano. They would play a few moments and then dance out to the center of the room. One stopped, poised in the form of a cross. The other danced on to get to the preacher's Bible and then laid it at the feet of the other. All realized that the Holy Ghost was instructing them to stand on the Word of God as the only rule of faith and practice. The sister continued to be led of the Spirit, dancing into another room, picking up a baby, and showing by her motions that all were to be submissive to the Holy Ghost as the little child was to her, and stand on the Bible as our guide and keep low at the feet of Jesus. Still under the power, the sister returned the baby to the bed. Then retrieving the Bible, she opened it and went straight to the preacher, handing it to him right side up for him to read. She ran her finger down the page and stopped. The preacher took the Bible, marked the place, and rose to preach. The second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 14, was the text. And for over one hour the preacher preached as he had never preached before. He was mightily under the power and demonstration of the Spirit, as the people laughed, cried, and shouted and danced in the Spirit. 
It was a glorious time to be whole. The preacher was later to say, the Lord took me further out of myself than I had ever been before in preaching. Wonderful does not do justice to a description. The Lord had blessed, the man had preached, and the people rejoiced. That man was A.J. Tomlinson. The date was March 29, 1924. The place was in the Bahamas, and the service was in progress. The falling of the power of God, as reported by one of the local officials of the church, was the greatest they had ever seen. Throughout the service, the proceedings were interpreted with occasional showers of God's blessing. In the glory of God's power for the service begins a description as such. Shower after shower rained down upon the people until finally one great downpour soaked the people with the exciting move of God. For one continuous hour, the people literally rejoiced, sweeping and dynamically being used by the Holy Ghost. As fire was over, hundreds of people dancing in the spirit as the steady fall of God's glory had no stop to it. Then the preacher stepped forward and from 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. preached under the mighty anointing and demonstration of the Spirit of God. It was late, but God was moving as the people made their way to the altar. On and on the power continued to fall, 11 p.m., 11.30 p.m., and on to midnight. The people were witnessing a phenomenal move of the Holy Ghost. The service came to a close. But the move of God continued as people danced and talked in tongues on the streets as they went home. The power of God fell in the beginning of the service, in the middle of the service, at the end of the service, and even continued after the service. Just another service in the life of this dynamic preacher. That man was A.J. Tomlinson. The date was May 18, 1924. The place was Slanton, Tennessee. It was troubling times for the saints of God. Opposition had already arrived in the community and was attempting to destroy the influence of the preacher. Service had to be held in a private home, but a large crowd was already gathering, both in the house and outside in the yard. The service never began officially because the power began to fall as people began to enter the home. For two solid hours, the Spirit of God literally filled every room of that house. Tears flowed from every eye. Much demonstration and power was viewed by all. A kind of light or glory flame played up and down the preacher constantly for two hours. It would come down, engulf him, and then suddenly arise. Again and again, the glory flame settled above, on, and around the preacher. There was no doubt about it. Despite the opposition, the people knew. While man tried to stop and destroy God's work, God simply confirmed the truth. This man was the man of God. This man was that man, A.J. Tomlinson. The year was 1924. The place was Somerset, Kentucky. The service was in progress, with the preacher steering the crowd through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Never in these last days has man ever worked with the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost with man as did this preacher. The congregation was rising higher and higher upon each wave of inspirational utterance. The man was preaching and the Holy Ghost was inspiring, and the people were rejoicing. Suddenly, as if it had been prearranged, the preacher stopped his preaching. He sat down and simply stated, I will sit down while the Holy Ghost takes the stand. Immediately a message in other tongues splashed through the pastor and the interpretation was given. The Holy Ghost had spoken and the man resumed his preaching. The Holy Ghost and the man in unity. The Holy Ghost and the man carrying the message. The Holy Ghost and the man working together as never before this side of the dark ages. The Holy Ghost and the man, that man, A.J. Tomlinson. The date was September the 25th, 1925. At 6.30 p.m., a crowd was gathered on a vacant lot in Cleveland, Tennessee. Some were coming out of curiosity, for an unusual series of announcements had been advertised in the local newspaper for seven consecutive days. Some were coming out with extreme despair, for a lifetime of labor had just been blown aside by the twisting winds of spiritual chaos. But in the midst of despair, spiritual chaos, and stormy winds of spiritual error, there was one man who realized, "'Tis the set of sails and not the gales which tell us the way to go. With a box for his platform, the truth of God for his text, he preached a dynamic stirring message. Like a bowl of lightning, enthusiasm shot through the crowd. Despair turned to hope, to faith, and idleness to effort. The preacher had turned it around. Pledges were made, promises kept. The lot was purchased, and a tabernacle built, 
the Church of God was once again on course for her destination. That man was A.J. Tomlinson. The date was January the 20th through the 25th, 1926. The place was in Bridgetown, Barbados. The revival was in progress. The preacher was expounding the truth, and God was honoring the truth with signs and wonders. History was being made as the move of God thrilled the large crowd. Night after night, in each successive service, the theme of the revival built higher and higher. People were saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. People slain by the power of God were so thick that they often fell on each other. Three pillars of smoke rose from the platform. A flash of fire extended across the platform. The supernatural presence of God was evident in all places at all times. The move of God was being manifested and the spirit of the church was at an all-time high. The biggest landslide to date in one service was in progress. The preacher took the pulpit, preached his message, instructed the people, and then opened the doors of the church. People began to rise all over the building to step forward to be united with the great church of God. From the front, from the back, from the left, from the right, they were coming. Twenty, ten, thirty, forty. They came with the joy of the Lord in their hearts. One hundred, one hundred and ten, one hundred and twenty. They marched towards the preacher in unity of the spirit. History was being made. 10, 20, 50, 60, 70, 100, 110, 120, 130 people united by covenant to the great church of God. As they stood before the preacher, history was made by the man this side of the dark ages. That man was A.J. Tomlinson. The date was May 1st, 1930. The place was a hotel in Charleston, West Virginia. The traveling preacher was tired but feeling a satisfaction that could only come from fulfilling God's calling. He had labored well in the month of April, from Texas to Louisiana, into Alabama, onto Ohio by way of Tennessee, and finally through Michigan. The preacher traveling by night and working and studying by day, traveled many miles preaching at every opportunity. Everywhere he went, the move of God was in full force. A minister tells of a woman near an area in Texas being raised from the dead. In Louisiana, parents tell of two small girls also coming back to life from the dead. God wonderfully blessed in Alabama. Eleven united with the Church of God in Ohio. Fire was seen flashing about in two of his sermons in Tennessee, and God moved mightily in Michigan. April was indeed a full and rewarding month for this enthusiastic servant of God. He was exhausted, but he was happy. His body was worn, but his soul was blessed. In only 30 short days, with God's wonderful help, the traveling preacher had crossed five states, preached 55 sermons, and witnessed the phenomenal move of God. That man was A.J. Tomlinson. The date was September the 12th through the 18th, 1934. The place was the 29th Annual Assembly in Cleveland, Tennessee. The preacher was given his personal report to the General Assembly of his work for the past year. Traveled by train, bus, automotive, truck, airplane, streetcar, and on foot. Distance traveled 29,845 miles. Places traveled 38 states, one island, and Mexico. Reasons traveled, revivals, 40 conventions, and a general church work. And preaching in all travels, 428 messages. The zeal of the man would not let him stop. The enthusiasm of the man would not let him slow down. The vitality of the man would not let him rest. For that zeal, that enthusiasm, that vitality was generated from a burning desire to take the message, perfect the work, and accomplish that which God had chosen him to do. That zeal, that enthusiasm, that vitality led him to accomplish in one year 428 messages, in one year visit 40 conventions, in one year visit 38 states, in one island, and one foreign country and in one year traveled 29,845 miles. How old was the man? Believe it or not, the man was 68 years old. That man was A.J. Tomlinson. The date was Saturday, September the 18th, 1937. The 32nd Annual Assembly was history. The Holy Ghost had manifested himself time and time again upon the general overseer as he prepared and meditated for that assembly. He would speak in tongues in the office, at the table while eating, at all hours of the night while he was in bed, since August the 12th. Prayer meetings had been conducted at 6.30 p.m. for the specific purpose of asking God to touch his feet, legs, eyes, and vocal cords. 
to equip him for the assembly. Physical weak, but spiritually strong, the general overseer moderated the assembly as he had done for the past 31 assemblies. The assembly officially closed on Tuesday at midnight, September the 14th, 1937. God had wonderfully supplied the strength enabling him to hold up under the physical stress of session after session. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday passed into history. Then came Saturday, September 18, 1937, and it happened. The man collapsed. The spirit was willing, but the physical was indeed weak. Weak from 72 years of tremendously active labor for the master. For three days, he would be in a semi-conscious condition. True to his character and determination, however, God was not through with this man. Just a few short months later, he would again travel some 20,000 miles, attend 12 conventions, and a few more months of work in the office from early morning until late at night. The warrior was still able to fight. The leader was still able to lead. The man was still able to stand. That man was A.J. Tomlinson. The date, November the 8th, 1940. Four men made their way up the steep incline of the mountain. Climbing was not easy, for the mountainside was dotted with many trees and underbush, was thick with thorny bushes, and the slope of the hill was steep, steep enough to rapidly tire their legs and shorten their breath. They seemed to be looking for something, searching for an exact spot. Slowly they approached the top. Very tired, they found their destination. They were excited. This is the place, the leader of the group said. Following his example, the other three men knelt with him in prayer. What was the meaning of this climb? What was the meaning of this search? What was the meaning of the excitement in the man's cry as he said, this is the place? Little could these men realize the tremendous task that they had begun. Little could they comprehend the far-reaching effect of locating that small plot of ground. Little could they envision the worldwide example they had set. But even though they could not possibly realize, comprehend, or envision totally what they had done, they set into motion the tremendous, far-reaching, and worldwide program of enlightening the world with the message of the Church of God. For that place was the top of Burger Mountain. That climb was the first effort to locate and mark biblical places of interest this side of the Dark Ages. That group of men was the first of many to catch the zeal of the marking program. And it all came to be because of that man who prayed the prayer on June 13, 1903. That man was A.J. Tomlinson. The date was October the 2nd, 1943. The place was Cleveland, Tennessee. The words in his diary would read, Great things close by now. Written under the entry for September the 8th through the 14th, the dates for the 28th Annual Assembly. He was expecting a great assembly. The assembly came and went, fulfilling his anticipation. Shortly after the assembly, he and several other men traveled to Fields of the Wood, Culberson, North Carolina, and back to Cleveland, Tennessee. On September the 15th, he worked at his office, returning home for supper around 6 p.m. Around midnight, after returning from working at his office again in the evening, the beginning of the end struck. He became seriously ill. It was the illness that would bring to an end the earthly struggle of the great warrior. He would talk very little during the illness, only to reply when he was asked how he was feeling, I am near the end. The last words in one of the most profound religious diaries ever written were great things close by now. The end came to this life at 10 a.m. Saturday, October the 2nd, 1943. Great things close by now began immediately thereafter. That man was A.J. Tomlinson, the first general overseer of the Church of God, this side of the Dark Ages.